Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, Cameron jumped ahead of me a little bit there because I was going to summarise some themes that I've seen uh, emerging uh, when I uh, uh, describe the work I've done that's been published uh, uh, earlier this year. And so one thing I was going to say is that, uh, uh, maybe repeat a little bit what Cameron said, there's several themes already emerging. Um, the use of pre-existing collections, um, the use of pre-existing uh, uh, systems or ad adapting a system for it to be flexible like in... Um, uh, several talks you heard about with regards to the Ebola outbreak. Once that's under control, could these uh, infrastructures be used uh, in other capacities as well, maybe moved around the country or, or adapted? Um, and then previous uh, discussions earlier today, we heard about multiplexing um, from a single sample, so you're detecting uh, multiple pathogens. Um, and this would increase the, the cost effectiveness of um, different diagnostic assays. Uh, so I'll be uh, briefly just about some uh, interesting points and uh, some uh, relevant points with regards to the history of polio. Um, so if you're here yesterday, you would have heard that, you know, there's evidence that the, uh, there's polio in Egypt uh, 3,000 uh, BC, so that's 5,000 years ago. It should be BC, really. Um, so here we have a, an image of a man with a walking stick and a withered uh, leg. And so this is, seems to be a, 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 from the Egyptologist's point of view, they're thinking this, this is quite possibly a clear example of um, a man, a depiction of a man uh, with polio in ancient Egypt. Um, it wasn't known what caused these. Uh, then in 1908, the uh, discovery of the polio virus by Carl Landstein and Owen Popper. And then later on, we have uh, uh, methods of, uh, of um, allowing people to uh, survive and, and live uh, with the disease. In 1928, we have the first use of the iron lung. And 90, 90 years on, it's interesting that there's three people in America have been identified as still uh, living in an iron lung. Some of these have been li living in there for 50 years uh, in an iron lung. Um, and so although that's depressing, uh, it'll, you'll see how that contrasts with the more optimistic um, uh, position we have on polio control now. So in 1963, the introduction of the oral, oral polio vaccine uh, 1998, we had the Global Polio Control Initiative, uh, and this was established when there was uh, around 350,000 children infected. Um, by 2007, the WHO declares eradication of polio in the Americas, Europe, and Western Pacific. And uh, currently, um, 2.5 billion children have been vaccinated uh, with the involvement of 200 countries and uh, 20 million volunteers. <clears throat> and I think this is a uh, a great example of the uh, human spirit and endeavour. And if we were able to eradicate this disease, this would be the third disease um, we as a species have been able to eradicate off the face of this earth. The first being smallpox, second being rinderpest, which is a veterinary disease, but we can still put that on our tally of victories. And uh, hopefully this will be the third in the near future. Um, so that's a very positive story. Um, there's several uh, arms, to the, there's two main arms to the polio control, uh, the vaccination efforts and also the surveillance efforts to maintain uh, control in, in the countries that are, uh, where we've seen a, a reduction in prevalence and elimination of the disease as well. And this surveillance is supported by 146 uh, laboratories spread across the globe, um, with 16 of these based in sub-Saharan Africa. And these 16 laboratories in sub-Saharan Africa receive, on average, I think across the last 10 years, like 20,000 samples a year. Uh, to the right, we have a graph of um, uh, the proportion of wild polio uh, detected, um, and also the number of stool samples screened. So you can see um, the overall trend is, uh, is a massive decrease in a uh, wild polio uh, detection, um, and all, but also a big increase in the, in the surveillance. Um, so the, the question that our work wanted to answer is, um, we have this fantastic um, surveillance network, surveillance system. I think the funding for it is $12 billion a year. Um, and it's about to achieve success. And so what's the future of this? Um, and it's not just our group that have been asking this question. Uh, I'm not going to take credit for that, and certainly not me. You know, several people have been asking this question. Um, so then moving on. Ooh. Moving on from our, uh, just talking about polio, I'll give you a little bit of background um, to STH and Schisto. So these are the two NTDs that we've decided to, to target um, using these 
polio collection, uh, fecal collections uh, stored in, a, in the Ghanaian uh, polio laboratory. And one of the main reasons, uh, uh, perhaps I shouldn't need to stay of targeting STH and Schistu, is that um, these are both diseases uh, um, that are typically diagnosed through the screening of feces, except for uh, Schistu and hematopium, um, although that can occur in the feces and in some events. Um, but also just to point out that um, although these are relatively low, have low lethality, um, they have a massive burden uh, with, with regards to the number of cases, although we have, you can see that the percentage has decreased, um, uh, I think, since um, the previous studies. This is the, these tables are taken from the Global <coughs> Burden of Disease um, uh, study 2013, looking at the results from 2013. This was published in 2017. But even though there's been a decrease, there's still a huge prevalence of both these diseases in the world. Um, and they also amount to a significant portion of the DALIs uh, assigned to the NTD group. So we thought, for several reasons, these are two good diseases to target. Um, so in preparation of, of uh, using the Ghanaian Global Polio Laboratory Network, we carried out a uh, QPCR workshop where we'll introduce new DNA extraction methods, um, the new QPCR assays to the, to the workers at the GPLN in Ghana, um, targeting uh, these particular helmets. So we've grouped uh, the QPCR assay used to screen for schistosomiasis uh, is a generic one, so we're not distinguishing between the two species. But seeing as it's a fecal sample, we can safely assume that the majority of these will be S. mansoni. Um, but we do have the capacity to revisit those samples and identify which species that is. And then the other worms are Trichurus trichuria, Ascaris lumpicoides, um, the two hookworm species, Nicator americanus and Ankylostoma, and also Strongyloides stercoralis, which I think has been included in the STH group. Um, so the STH is actually a large collection of uh, helmet species. So this is a, a pilot study. We can't really infer any significant epidemiological data from this. Um, we screened 466 uh, samples from the Ghanaian polio collection, much to the chagrin of my line manager who felt 500 would be a nice round number to get to. Um, so we are pursuing uh, further screening of these samples. And, and this is just the, the uh, results that we reported in the paper. So Ascaris lumbricoides um, proved to be uh, the most prevalent of the worms followed by the, if you lump the two hookworm species together, it would be hookworm. Surprisingly, no uh, trichuria uh, was detected, and then uh, schistosoma and uh, uh, strongyloides was detected as well. And this is kind of significant as well, because the majority of these helmets can be picked up by cater cats, although strongyloides sacralis is notoriously difficult to be picked up through that method. You need to use different uh, uh, fecal um, analysis methods to pick up strongly, and typically, culturing and over six days, I think seems to be the, uh, the best traditional gold standard method to use. Um, so I think we're, we're able to prove in principle that you can use the same samples in the global laboratory network uh, collections. Um, and you can see we've actually had uh, samples from across the country uh, on the map there in different proportions. And there's some surprising things there. So in the Volta region, we found no schistosoma, you may, have, you may have been expecting to find more schistosoma within the Volta region, but then it might depend on the species present. So if it's hematobium, we may not be picking it up. And then this is just uh, some further uh, descriptive um, analysis of, of the samples collected. Um, so one of the worries was that the, perhaps the, the individuals who are supplying the samples, um, they may be very young, because typically they're children who are presenting with acute flaccid paralysis, and there's a worry that we might not get any anyone above the age of two. Um, but in the, the table on the bottom there, you can see the average age um, is, uh, is fairly stable across the different regions, um, but it, the average age is between two to three to uh, four. Um, and then, again, proportion of samples per district. I think across about six districts, we're getting fairly even representation. Um, but then the certain districts where we're seeming to get fewer samples, then one district, uh, Brong Afo, has uh, significantly more samples have come from that area. Um, uh, earlier this year, I, I went back to Ghana and met up with the team there again, um, and we processed another um, 
414, I think, samples. Um, and this is just a, a rough uh, graph showing the differences between the first 446 and the other uh, 414. So these were collections from different periods in time as well. So the first lot of samples we processed uh, came from samples that had collect been collected from 2013 to 2015. Uh, the second set came from collections from 2016 and 2017. So there are interesting uh, differences there. So uh, we found a higher number of um, strongyloides in the most recent sampling. Um, hookworm, there's a difference uh, between the two, where the previous sampling had shown a high, high amount of hookworm. An interesting asterisk, which was found in the majority of our samples, has decreased as well. Um, again, these are small studies. Um, the take a message is there that there seems to be variation uh, between uh, time points, and this could be reflected of uh, origins of samples as well. So um, there was some discussion uh, yesterday about how, how do we inform uh, the public and inform the wider community of our work, and there was a bit of a toing and froing between researchers and, and reporters. Um, but this is just a, a, a brief overview of, um, of this publication. It got given a, a press release by PLOS NTD. At LSTM, we've got our own comms department. We informed them, and they decided to give our, our paper a, a press release as well. And it's picked up by a number of uh, scientific news websites um, and also in-country uh, news websites as well, like Modern Ghana. So I thought this was a, a little interesting uh, touchback to yesterday when some of these issues of how do you disseminate this information and, and uh, put, it, put it across clearly uh, to, a, to a wider audience, not just within um, kind of academic publications. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, all those involved in the study, especially the Ghanaian Global Polar Laboratory Network team, uh, headed by Dr. John Odumi, um, all the different institutes involved, and uh, for your patience listening to me today.